Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, welcome to the final session of the Graph Drawing Conference. I'm happy to see that you're still here. We saved the best for last, and the, the, it's these four presentations. First speaker, Benjamin Bach. Thank you. Um, hello, and welcome to my talk on interactive random graph generation with evolutionary algorithms using our tool Graph Cuisine. Uh, this work has been done with um, André Spritzer from Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Evelyn Luton and Journal Fequet from INRIA France. So this is Bob. He works for a big, huge company. And he created the ultimate layout algorithm for relative networks. Bob's problem is, or his, what he wants, is to get the next, this paper in the next graph drawing for next year. <coughs> and this is just an image of a routing network. So Bob's problem is that such routing networks contain a lot of sensitive information in their topology. And you can imagine you cannot just hand over such uh, routing networks to everyone or test us uh, do usability studies with such a networks. So, but, but Bob wants to test his algorithm. So what he needs to do is to create similar networks that have, uh, let's say, the same um, topological properties as this network. And since you want to test different conditions, he has to change the network slightly in order to test his algorithm and write his paper. So what can Bob do? He can generate graphs if he cannot use this data set he has. And for generating graphs, he needs to generate graphs with particular measures, such as certain size and less size and more, uh, uh, less clusters and so on. And then he needs slightly to change these measures for each of the graphs. Now what Bob also wants, or um, is direct feedback on these graphs. So just uh, generating them and then waiting and then have a look again and changing everything, he does not want that. So usually when generating these networks, what we do is we need first a generator. And once we have a generator, we need to know its parameters um, in order to get our properties that we want. And in the second part of this generation, we, want, we need to, to know the parameters to change in order to change our network. So if we want the networks bigger or more clusters, less clusters, such things. So now let me explain how we do this with Graph Cuisine, which is an interactive, explorative approach to graph generation. So we can generate graphs, we can mimic uh, real world data sets, and once we mimic them, we can also adapt them. Okay. So you imagine the, snap, uh, the, the image from the routing network in the first scenario. Now, this is the interface of Graph Cuisine, and we already have imported the network into Graph Cuisine. So now it appears there in, the, um, in this one view. And on the left side, Graph Cuisine had created some graphs that look like this one and has several measures, uh, uh, has some, the same measures as these imported networks. So how do we create this similarity? Um, in this parallel coordinate plot, we have one vertical line for each um, common graph measure. So in this case, we have uh, the node amount, we have the edge amount, we have density, a uh, diameter of these graphs. And the white knobs here highlighted by uh, red circles, those are the measures um, of our imported network. And the other, poly the other poly lines in this uh, parallel coordinate plot, they represent the graphs Graph Cuisine has created. And as you can see, they already converge towards uh, the imported measures, the measures of the imported graph. And as I said, in addition, the user can already see the network, how they look like, and if they are actually the same for him. OK, good. At this point, we can say, this is what we want, and we export our graphs. So we have a lot of graphs, and we can test our algorithm. Second point, how to adapt these measures. We can use this directly. We can do this in this uh, parallel coordinates plot by simply um, either moving the target measures, or and, and then we can also lower um, 
uh, set the importance of each of these measures. So how important is this for calculating the similarity? And in this case, we just shrink the uh, width of the colored bars. And after doing so, in this case, we uh, lowered the amount of clusters we want to have in the network. We get networks with less clusters. And at this point, again, we can um, export our networks or we can further uh, continue exploring our solutions. So I was talking a lot about um, optimization and creating networks, but so how do we do it actually? Because this is only the interface. There's some magic in the background. And this is where we need our evolutionary algorithm. So evolutionary algorithms um, are an optimization problem that model the problem as an inverse problem. That is first, we have a population of solutions which are encoded in a chromosome. This is very, pretty much the process as in nature. So we have chromosomes that represent solutions and then we select chromosomes, we create new solutions, we have to calculate how well or how fit these solutions are, if they survive or if they do not survive. And for graphs you can imagine we have two generated graphs already, there's two parents, we take them, we create a new child of them which has um, characteristics of both of the parents and then uh, there is some mutation as it always happened so to make a proper child. And as I said the final question is how to um, assess similarity or how to assess the fitness of this individual. And in many cases this target graph is um, either an Im imaginary graph the user wants to create for his experiments or uh, it is one of the, our real world data sets. And then by iterating over this uh, optimization process, we approach our optimal solution. Now, one problem is um, how to define similarity. Of course, we can run the algorithm a lot of times, and then he might come up with a good solution that is already uh, pretty close, but similarity is in the eye of the user in this case. So the whole optimization problem turns into an exploration problem. The user needs to explore his solutions. And this is where we need interaction in this whole process. So it's an interactive evolutionary algorithm, actually, that we use in this case. And interaction, interaction can, be, um, can be at several points of this evolution process um, in the upper right corner. So let me explain how this more or less abstract um, process is implemented in graph cuisine. So of course we have our population of solutions which are um, a set of graphs and these graphs has then um, of course they are encoded in chromosomes and chromosome in evolutionary algorithms is simply a list of um, parameters and their values. So first from these parameter list we need to create graphs and this um, is done in graph using by using a pipeline of graph generators. So we have here in this example we have a generator G1 which creates some star motifs. Then it hands over to a graph generator G2 which introduces some uh, edges and the graph generator G3 uh, inserts some, um, some random noise. So in graph using we implemented uh, several motive generators for particular motifs and some we call them noise generators, but it's, it's not negative in this case. Um, that create edges and uh, nodes according to several laws, basically. So now we have our generators. And each of these generators is controlled by a set of parameters, of course. So for example, we have a star generator, which has as input parameters the number of stars you should create the degree the stars should have and the variance in degree that because you don't want all the stars to be the same, probably, maybe. Um, and here we make the link to the chromosome. So each of these um, input parameters for our graph generators are encoded in this chromosome, in, a um, in the chromosome. So for example, here we have our star generator, which has the parameter one is the number of stars, the parameter two is the degree of the stars and the last parameter is the degree variance and then it just does what it has been told. So the other, there are some, some other parameters um, on this chromosome such as those two, they are more or less for controlling the pipeline how, as, such as the order of the generators because they, can, they might change and whether they're active or not. 
And um, yeah. So once we created the graph from a chromosome, now imagine our population has around uh, 50 chromosomes, or so we have around 50 graphs. We need to assess uh, the fitness of each of them, of each single one. And this is where we come back to these uh, common graph measures that we have here. Currently, we implemented um, eight of them, but let me talk about this a bit later. <coughs> so what we need to do is to get from each of the graphs that we generated the common graph measures, and then we apply a, a weighted fitness function, a weighted difference function, sorry, to um, calculate the error, basically, of this graph. And the lower the error is, the fitter the graph is. So, and this runs for several... Um, um, for several optimization cycles, for several generations alone, and then the, um, the result is presented to the user. So this user can decide whether he just continues um, with this optimization or whether he changes parameters um, and so on. And this is where the interaction comes in this process. Now there are five uh, interaction possibilities in graph cuisine where the user can steer this uh, evolutionary algorithm process. The first is, as I showed you in the um, scenario, um, to directly set its target, his target measure. So he wants a graph of a certain size, with a certain density, with a certain amount of clusters, and so on. The second one is, since he sees the graph already there, he can just select them. And the system then interferes about the measures that the user is <coughs> most interested in. So it's not that we keep these graphs particularly, but we keep the measures. Um, the third interaction possibility, more or less, is that we have some templates, which are predefined sets of measures and predefined sets for our generators. So if the user loads a template for uniform graphs, um, that will be the system tries to create uniform graphs. So without with just one component and a very low clustering coefficient, for example. Because, yeah, often it's very hard to know even what, um, what is the combination of measures to get a certain type of graph. Um, and then, of course, he can enable and disable certain generators. So if he does, does not want to have any clicks in his graphs, he just disable this and see how the other generators work with that. Um, and finally, the um, user is able to, to steer the evolutionary algorithm itself because there are a lot of parameters in the system hidden that uh, when we were playing around with graph cuisine, we tried to tweak these parameters so that they fit well. But of course, uh, there's always space for optimization or depending on the problem the user wants to solve. So um, this is a set of complex parameters already there where Ironically, we need another evolutionary algorithm for that, but it's another story. So, <clears throat> however, the results we get, um, I don't say it's perfect, but it works. So, as you can see in this parallel coordinates plot, um, for this uh, first set of measures that the user input, we get solution. Um, and on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, there we have the this is a diagram of the fitness of our population. So the blue curve actually is the best solution in this current population. And since it goes to zero, it means it's even better. So now, usually it goes down, but sometimes it goes up. And when it goes up means that the user has changed one of these measures. And you can imagine if the user changes the density, the complete population uh, gets less fit. And then we have these these vertical black bars. This is always when um, the current solution population is shown to the user, then he can decide to continue or to change things. So it goes up when there's something black and then it goes down again. So this is, um, uh, this curve is very important for evolutionary algorithm to test or to uh, prove that the algorithm works. And so now we generate graphs for our group to test, um, to use these graphs in experiments on graph visualization and uh, visual graph interfaces. But um, there are open issues, of course, as in any system. So we need first to improve the interface. Because if you might have noticed, there are several dependencies between the graph parameters we use. So you cannot just set the density and the edge 
amount and the node amount to some um, arbitrary values, you will get either no result or a very bad result. So this is a more a question of interface design. Uh, how do we make the user know that if he changes one of these measures, the others will, uh, they, they have automatically also to change, or then maybe you can lock some parameters and so on. Uh, another issue is about parameter distribution. So you want to have a certain distribution of a degree in your graph, which is currently not possible with graph greasy, not from the technical point. So the um, evolutionary algorithm can handle it very well. It's more or less the interface issue again. So we, you need curves that you want to adapt, or you might need checkboxes, or somehow to talk the, to allow the user to specify his, uh, the distribution he wants. And of course, we want to, to put more visualization in the interface or color nodes according to degree or whatever, so that it's even more easier for the user to see the similarity between graphs or to spot the graphs he wants. Um, but so far, the system is very extensible. So we use um, a set of generators and a set of measures, and each of them is extensible. So you can create measures, uh, you can ask for other measures, and the set we implemented right now might not be optimal. So we're playing around to optimize the set of measures, um, which leads to the last problem of calculation time. Some of these measures, um, such as calculating the clusters or the clustering coefficient for each of the nodes, uh, takes time. And you can imagine if you need to do this for all 50 graphs in a population, this slows the system. So this is the bottleneck of uh, graph cruising currently, but it works fine for up to 100 nodes. It takes uh, um, about um, one minute to create, to go over five generations. So the system does five optimization itself and then shows it to the user. Um, and this clearly we want to optimize. I think there is a lot of space to get this, um, to get this time, to lower this time basically. And of course, what we like the most is to get feedback from actual users that use graph cuisine to generate their graphs, the new uh, suggestions. So don't hesitate to go to our website, avis.fr, research graph cuisine, uh, or send me just an email. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions? Peter. I guess if you're going to use this for a scientific experiment, then you'd need some sort of guarantee uh, on its uh, randomness, basically, that the that you get. Some, you need to know something about the distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd need something either provable empirically or provable mathematically. Can you provide anything like that? Um, about distribution, you mean? It's something that says, like, suppose that you're looking for all graphs with, uh, that divide, in some sense, into five clusters. You want to know that your distribution overall graph is uniform. Your choice is, is a uniform choice. And it's, it's not clear to me that this method of using the evolutionary algorithm uh, does anything like that. Um, <clears throat> we go back to this picture. So I'm not sure if I got your question uh, properly. But for now, we, sh we can show kind of distribution visually how the distribution of certain measures is in the graph. So for example. The distribution of the graph's output, right? So that if, you know, there's, there's a, a profile that you're aiming for, mm -hmm. and there might be, you know, a million graphs that, that satisfy that profile, and you want to choose one with probability one over a million. Can you? Can you, the, the probability that you get one is exactly one over a million, or even close to one over a million. I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. Sorry, sorry. We can talk. Uh, Offline, just, okay. I mean, I want to know. It. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Final question by Ulrich. Basically, the same question because in other in other experimental settings, you would generate those graphs from some distribution that is pre-specified. Your distribution now is characterized by a few fixed features, but nothing is said about what all of the graphs that satisfy these features, how you select from them, and are there any systematic biases that the process that you propose um, introduces into this sample? Like, because you start from motifs and mm -hmm. have a certain way of going to the next generation. If we... So you mean... Um...
let, let's put, let me put it this way. Um, you, you have all the, these features specified, mm -hmm. all of the graphs that satisfy these features, maybe many, but the ones you're generating are only those that have another feature fixed to some specific value. It might happen in this process. Then that would not be a good choice from that set. But in, in this case, the, um, there are graphs that, that, that feature um, that fit exactly these values. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Was was there one more comment from Alex? Quick comment. It goes also in the same direction. So <laughs> suppose <laughs> it's the, you, you have a, there's another system that doesn't use uh, uh, evolutionary algorithms. How would you compare your system to that system? How would you tell which system is better? Um, since we focus a lot of, inter, uh, of the interface, uh, we can. That's what I mean. That's not what you mean. So by just by the graph output. Yes. Um, we can we can hand in the same graph, uh -huh. and, um, and then test how close it is to these measures. If, if it just returns the same graph again, then it'll be exactly those ah, measures, right? You mean exactly so the double exponential? You want something same. that's random that's close to it, but um, but. It would easily satisfy that criterion by just re returning the sample graph. Oh, okay, okay, I, I know what you mean. So this is exactly what you don't want when you create. <laughs> yes. So and this. So here you see it's not optimal. I mean, there's. Um, I mean, this is exactly where you need the, the, the interaction. You don't want to 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 set uh, to choose this graph that is your input graph, and. Um, it's definitely interesting to, to, to see how, how far we can get to the exact right topology. But here we do not encode the typology, the, uh, the typo yeah, topology of the graph directly. So, okay, yeah. mm -hmm. we have to stop. Uh, yeah, thank sure. you a lot. <laughs> Let's go to the second talk. That's by Andrew Suk. Yes. That's right. right. So, um, okay, so I like to talk about some density or Ramsey type theorems uh, for intersection graphs of T monotone curves, and I'll define what this word T monotone means in a minute. Um, so, these theorems were motivated by three pretty closely related problems in graph drawing uh, or in topological graph theory. So, just as a reminder, a topological graph is a graph drawn in the plane where the vertices are represented by points and the edges are represented by curves connecting the corresponding points. Uh, we say a topological graph is simple if every pair of edges have a, at most one point in common. So here's an example of a topological graph, but it's clearly not simple because these two red edges here have more than one point in common. So these three problems in graph drawing, uh, they're about simple topological graphs. And in simple topological graphs, every pair of edges essentially looks like one of these three pictures here. So either they have a common endpoint, or a common interior point, which is known as crossing, or they simply have no points in common, like over here. So the first problem that I was interested in in, in, uh, in graph drawing was this problem here, which is known as a Thraco conjecture, which Andres mentioned uh, just a little bit ago. So it states that every n-vertex simple topological graph with no two disjoint edges has at most n edges. Um, this conjecture is still open, and uh, it seems pretty tough. And as Andres mentioned, this is currently the best known upper bound. But uh, if you assume that your edges are drawn with segments or more generally x monotone curves, then the conjecture has been proven to be true. Uh, so Erdos proved this several decades ago. And somewhat recently, Pock and Sterling proved this uh, for x monotone curves. And roughly around the same period, uh, several other people have also proved the Thrakel conjecture for uh, the X monotone case. So the second problem is kind of a generalization of this problem here, uh, which is a question, uh, which is a conjecture due to Pock and Toth. So they conjecture that every n vertex simple topological graph with no k pairwise disjoint edges still has where k is fixed, still has at most a linear number of edges. Uh, this conjecture is still open, and uh, the best known upper bound is due to Pock and Toth, who got a pretty good bound. So they got n poly log n, where the log has this uh, 4k minus 8 in the exponent. 
but again, if you assume that your edges are drawn with segments or more generally X monotone curves, then this conjecture is true. And this was proven by Pock and Turoczyk back in 1993. Um, in their 1993 paper, they proved it for segments, but the argument easily generalizes to X monotone curves. So if you look at this Pock and Toth theorem here, uh, basically, it says that if you have an n-vertex simple topological graph with more than this many edges, then you can say for sure somewhere there's going to be k pairwise disjoint edges. And so if you have a lot of edges, you would expect to find a large subset of pairwise disjoint edges. And so the third conjecture is that, is due to Pock and Toth, is that every n-vertex simple topological graph that is dense has a polynomial number of pairwise disjoint edges. So basically, there exists a delta that depends on the hidden constant here, such that this graph should have a, n to the delta of pairwise disjoint edges. Uh, the best known lower bound is due to Fox and Sudikoff, who showed that they can find roughly log to the 1.02 n pairwise disjoint edges. Uh, so this problem is pretty wide open. But again, if you assume that the edges are drawn with segments or more generally exponentone curves, then by, again, by that same paper, uh, this conjecture is true. And this was shown by Pock and Turoczyk. So these three problems are obviously pretty closely related. Oh, and just as a quick note, uh, so in case you're thinking that maybe this conjecture is kind of out there, there is some evidence that this conjecture uh, should be true. So last year, I was able to show that uh, a complete n-vertex simple topological graph does have uh, a polynomial number of pairwise disjoint edges, so roughly n to the one-third. But the proof uh, does not generalize to dense, dense graphs. So these three problems are closely related. Um, they are all still open, but they have been all solved for x-monotone curves. Um, but they're all still open for two-monotone curves. So when I say two-monotone, I mean an X monotone curve, and it, it could turn once. Um, and the reason is, is basically all of the X monotone arguments basically fall apart in this case. And so they all fall apart for T monotone curves. So a curve is, just to be clear, T monotone, if its interior has at most T minus one vertical tangent points. So a one monotone curve is simply X monotone. Uh, here's an example of a four monotone curve because its interior has three vertical tangent points. So it's like the union of four X monotone curves. So one of the main results I was able to show is that uh, basically I was able to say something about the second problem. So I was able to show that if G is an n-vertex simple topological graph and its edges are drawn with T monotone curves where T is some constant, let's say 1,000, then if G does not have K pairwise disjoint edges, then the number of edges well, I still have an n poly log n uh, bound, but the exponent now has this uh, order of log k in the exponent. And c of t is some constant that depends on t. So this is, was, uh, so just recall this was the Pock and Toth bound. So the improvement is basically on the order of k. So actually when k is small, like 3 or 4, the Pock and Toth bound is not only better, but it's also more general. But when k is large, this, this bound is uh, stronger than this one. And since this is logarithmic in k, this theorem immediately implies uh, something about dense graphs. So as an immediate corollary to this theorem, I was able to say something about the third problem. So I was able to show that if g is an n-vertex simple topological graph, again with curves drawn with t monotone curves for some constant t, and if your graph is dense, then G contains almost a polynomial, polynomial number of pairwise disjoint edges. So basically, N to some constant that depends on T divided by log log N pairwise disjoint edges. So just recall Fox and Sudikoff, they showed pretty much log N, but of course their, their theorem is uh, more general. And just recall the goal is to show that there's polynomial. Okay. So this theorem here, this uh, theorem on you know, the improvement of the second problem. So this theorem here basically follows from this uh, somewhat technical uh, two-color theorem that says the following. So if R is a family of n red t monotone curves, 
where T is some constant, say 1,000, and B is another family of N blue T monotone curves, such that R union B is simple, which means basically every pair of curves have at most one point in common. Then the claim is that there exist subsets R prime and B prime that are very large. They are an epsilon fraction of the family, so epsilon is some absolute constant, such that either every red curve in R prime crosses every curve in, in B prime, or every curve in R prime is completely disjoint to every curve in B prime. So this two-color theorem might sound uh, somewhat familiar because it has been proven for uh, other cases. So in particular, Pak and Shoyemoshi proved this two-color theorem for segments. And Alon et al. proved it for semi-algebraic sets in RD. And Basu proved it for definable sets belonging to some fixed definable family of sets in a no-minimal structure. Um, so these three proofs here, they're actually all pretty similar because they heavily depend on the fact that these geometric objects that they're dealing with have uh, bounded algebraic complexity. Uh, they're, they're not very complicated. You can easily express them with some Boolean expressions. Um, and so the proofs are pretty similar. And because they heavily depend on that fact, you can't just transfer these arguments and prove this two-color theorem. So you, you would have to do something different. Because these T-monotone curves can, be, can have arbitrarily large complexity. So this is actually the first time this two-color type theorem has been proven for a class of geometric objects that can have arbitrarily large complexity. So with this two-color theorem and plus Zemmerity's regularity lemma, you could get this density theorem, which is uh, the title of the paper. And I guess it's kind of like the main theorem. Uh, and then with this density theorem, you can prove uh, this result, the, the improvement of the second problem on the maximum number of edges with no k pairwise disjoint edges. OK. So I will just quickly sketch the proof of this two-color theorem, because it's actually pretty simple. So, so I just restated there, it there for your convenience. So suppose we have this n red t monotone curves in the plane, where t is some constant, say 1,000. And we have these blue curves in the plane. And the whole thing is simple. So we start by, so e, for each red curve, we'll call one of the endpoints the left endpoint. It doesn't matter which one. So we look at the left endpoints of each red curve. And we look at these points and these blue curves. Now, if I randomly sample C blue curves for some large constant C, and if I apply a trapezoid decomposition of the plane based on these uh, C curves, so what I mean is, at every endpoint, I'll draw a vertical line. And at every uh, vertical tangent point, I'll draw a vertical line. And these lines will go up either to positive or negative infinity, or it'll go up until it hits some other member in the sample. So when I do this decomposition, because these curves are t-monotone, and t is some constant, and I just sample the constant number of these uh, curves, uh, this decomposition, so I have decomposed the plane into at most a constant number of cells. There's only a, uh, there's not so many cells here. And because I did this randomly, uh, each cell, like let's say this one here, has the property that with very high probability, uh, n over 2 blue curves will not intersect the interior of this region here. And this is true for all regions. So, since there's at most a constant number of regions, and I had n points, one of the regions must have a lot of points by pigeonhole. So let's say it's this one. So what happened was basically, you know, what I did basically was I found a region R that contained a lot of points and a lot of blue curves, some positive fraction of them, uh, are completely disjoint to the interior of R. So now if I just look at these blue curves, and the remaining red curves, the ones with left endpoints in this region, I still have a lot of red curves left and a lot of blue curves left. So now, if I do the same thing with the right endpoints and the blue curves, if I do exactly the same thing over again, I'll obtain another region, R2, such that each red curve will have one endpoint in R1 and another endpoint in R2. And there'll still be a lot of red curves. And I'll still have a lot of blue curves left, some positive percentage. And these blue curves will not intersect the interior of R1 and R2. OK. 
So now I'm going to do the whole thing again uh, flipped with the color. So basically I'm going to do this whole process again with the endpoints of the blue curves and the red curves. And when I do this whole process again flipped, I'll obtain two more regions, R3 and R4, such that each remaining blue curve will have one endpoint in R3 and another endpoint in R4. And these blue curves will be disjoint to the interior of this R1 and R2. And likewise, each red curve will be disjoint to the interior of R3 and R4. And I'll still have a lot of blue curves and a lot of red curves left, some positive percentage of them. So the point is, is that I kind of have this nice structure here. I have somewhat contr uh, some control. And so now, basically, doing some case analysis, Jordan curve argument, like you know, the curve has to go this way or that way, you can, you can argue that uh, with this structure, there's a lot of either a lot of blue curves disjoint to a lot of red curves, or there's going to be a lot of blue curves crossing a lot of red curves. And that's the end of the proof. OK. So uh, if you think about that sketch proof that I just gave, I, rare, I didn't really use that T monotone condition much. The only part I used the T monotone condition was when I did that trapezoid decomposition. And so my point is, is that if you don't like this T monotone condition, if you, you find it a little bit strange, but you like these types of problems, then you might be interested in this problem here. Because if you can solve this problem, then I think you can obtain the same results that I did without the T monotone condition. Or at least you would get close. So the problem is, suppose you have endpoints uh, in the plane, and you have a family F of n curves such that you know, f is simple. Every pair of curves uh, intersects at most once. Then can you find a region R that contains a lot of points, some positive percentage of them, and such that this region R, is dis the interior, is disjoint to a lot of uh, blue curves? So this is, this is the open problem, some epsilon n fraction. If uh, you think this t monotone uh, condition is, is kind of a nice relaxation, uh, then maybe perhaps you might be interested in uh, proving the Thrakel conjecture for two monotone because this is still open. Or you might be interested in this coloring problem, which is, uh, which is pretty nice. So the coloring problem is that if you're given a family of uh, two monotone curves in the plane, such that there are no three pairwise disjoint members, the question is, can you color the non-intersection graph with that most a constant number of colors? So basically, I want to know if the if the non-intersection graph of these graphs are, is chi-bounded, basically. And this is, this is still open. Um, and again, if, if you assume these are segments or x monotone curves, then, then the chromatic number of the non-intersection graph is bounded. So it is true for segments or x monotone curves. Um, but it's, it's, it's still open for just two monotone. Um, and, and just as a quick note, I guess, the dual version is, is not chi-bounded. So the intersection graphs of, say, segments, is, it's not bounded by its, uh, the chromatic number is not bounded by its, uh, some function of its clique number. And that's it. Thanks. Right. Any questions? <laughs> no questions? All right, thanks again. Thanks. And we proceed with talk number three of the session, the second to last talk of the conference by Gabor Tardos. So, thank you for staying till the last session. <laughs> uh, just two more talks and you are done. Um, anyway, so I'm here to talk about uh, a geometrical problem of um, uh, visualization, but it's not exactly graph drawing. Um, so the setting is that you have an arrangement of, so you have a big map, for example, and you want to put dots on all the places where, I don't know, important people have born or something. And you want to arrange it in a such a way that, well, 
as much of this is uh, visible as possible, but uh, these uh, dots are overlapping, so I mean you have to f come up with a stacking order, like which comes on the top and which remains on the bottom, and of course which is the the uh, these that are higher up. I mean they obscuring the lower ones, so. There isn't too much that you see from this particular disk here. Uh, so how much you see in total in area, that's kind of independent, of course, of the ordering, but uh, maybe a better measure is how much of the perimeter of the disk you see. I mean, how much, how many, uh, how, what is the total length of the lines that you see? You want to arrange them in such a way that this is, uh, this is uh, biggest. So, um, <clears throat> so um, so again, the setting is that you don't move these disks. The disks, I mean, for this talk, they, uh, these are all unit disks or disks of the same size. Of course, you can ask the same question with disks of different size or other forms. Uh, but for this talk, they are all unit disks, and the, the place, the position of the disk are fixed. The only thing you can choose is an ordering, like a stacking order, which comes on top and which comes on bottom, and you want to maximize the visible perimeter. Uh, and for this talk, we are looking for the worst case instances, like how much you can absolutely guarantee. So if there are n disks, then I can absolutely guarantee wherever they are, in the best stacking order, will make sure that this amount or that much uh, of the perimeter will be visible. And you may say that it's not very realistic. If you want to visualize dots on a the map, then they usually don't, uh, I mean, it's not all of them are intersecting or overlapping. And usually they are kind of more scattered around, but uh, just uh, working with this version, the worst case, worst case setup is, uh, is good because that uh, gives you relevant uh, results on, uh, on a more realistic setup and it's not the number of um, disks, all of them um, overlapping, but there is like a bound of at most C of them overlapping then I mean, just using this uh, result as a black box, you can then come up with uh, results on this uh, more realistic setting. So this is uh, this Vernon V who started the, oh, by the way, so this talk is on joint research with um, Janusz Bach and Gabriel Nivash, and uh, uh, we were following uh, footsteps of Cabello Harvard von Kreveld and Speckmann, who uh, studied this problem first, and they came up with this very uh, uh, simple argument that if you have n disk, then at least root n total perimeter will be visible if you do it right. And there is a very simple argument for that. You can find uh, some subset of the disks that form a, a monotone sequence. So you can arrange them in such a way that both the x and the y coordinates are monotone in that sequence. You put them on top in that sequence, then at least one quarter of the perimeter of each of them is visible. And you don't care about the rest. Maybe you put the rest of the disk below all of these. Then you can, uh, um, so you have, um, yeah, you have this root n as a lower bound. And uh, they asked uh, if, uh, well, root n is very weak. I mean, maybe you can do actually a constant fraction of all the perimeter is visible. That would be much nicer. And, well, you can define how much. I mean, fn is the maximal visible perimeter for the worst case point set, but for the best stacking order. So whenever, or this set, whenever the disks are given, then you find the best order to stack them. And, uh, so this is what we were working on. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, 
none of these two bonds are uh, tight, uh, but we couldn't prove uh, that uh, you can do better than square root of n. We can prove that you can, for some set of this, you cannot do a linear. So we could at least answer this question. And so before I give you uh, anything more about this problem, I uh, start with the reformulation. I mean, this is the last uh, slide that I have that di has disks on it. So instead of disk, we will uh, turn the whole problem into a problem about angles. So first observation is that you have two disks, you bring them together, then whichever is higher up will cover strictly more from the lower disks. So not just more in terms of uh, length of the perimeter, but actually the set that is covered is a superset here. So if you are looking for a very bad uh, arrangement of this, if you put all of the disks much closer together, so instead of the points at P, you then look at the points at epsilon P where epsilon is something small, then it's an even worse uh, configuration. So uh, when you are looking for the worst configuration, you can actually consider uh, uh, this limit when epsilon goes to zero. And when you do that, uh, suddenly, I mean, this is all about angles. It turns out that uh, this limit, how much contribution a given disk is, is giving you in the limit, is very easy to formulate as, <clears throat> so this is tau i is the limit of the perimeter, of the length of the perimeter of one of your disks. Uh, that um, how much of that is visible, the limit of that. Uh, and that turns out to be zero if the center of that disk is within the convex hole of the um, higher up disk that will then eventually obscure the entire disk. Uh, and otherwise, if the, well, I'm sure that this is too low for anybody to see this picture, but if you have um, this point on the boundary, on the convex hole uh, of, um, of um, the higher up uh, centers, then what you are looking for is the external angle of the convex hole at that point. And so this pi minus the angle, the external angle, is exactly how much you will see. And then if you see this picture that so there is another disk somewhere along this line. So as it, uh, as it comes closer and closer, it will cover everything except, I mean, eventually it will cover half the perimeter here. And another disk coming from here covers another half here. And only in this little angle remains that will not be covered. So basically, the reformulation of the problem is a simple one. You don't have this, you have a set of points, a finite set of points in the plane. You want to order them in such a way, you start with just one point and then you add points and in each of, in every time you add the new point, you look at the angle of the convex hole at that new point. If that new point happens to be inside the convex hole, that's really bad, then you don't have any contribution there, otherwise, your contribution is the external angle at the new point. And you want to arrange the point in such a way that the sum of these external angles is as much as possible. And the question is how much can you guarantee to be the sum of the external angles? So that's an ex equivalent formulation with, without disks. And now comes the result. We have results for dense sets. So if the set of points so this is scale invariant at this point. So dense means that, uh, uh, I mean, like a grid, a gr set of grid points, like a square root 10 by square root 10 grid is dense. What I mean by dense is simply that the, you look at the smallest distance between two points and the largest distance between two points, and the ratio of these two is as small as, as possible. So 
Uh, it can be as, as small as uh, constant time square root of n. It obviously cannot be smaller than that. And if it's that small, we call that uh, the point set is dense. And so for dense point sets, we figured out kind of exactly what happens. Turns out that there is no good arrangement that would give you a linear uh, visible perimeter or, uh, or the sum of external angles. It's always, uh, it's always uh, uh, n to the 3 quarter at most. And there are point sets that achieve that. So it's n to the 3 quarter. It's already the answer is the, is it, can you always have a stacking order with linear visible perimeter question? No, you cannot. For any dense set, um, the, this will be less. It will be at most 10 to the 3 quarters. However, we were looking for the worst case set. So, I mean, this is much more. This is says that for every dense set, uh, so how about the worst case dense set? So, if you are looking for the worst case dense set, it happens to be the grid where this exponent of 3 quarter goes down to 2 third. And you cannot go lower than and to the two search for uh, dense sets, uh, this is the small, the worst case is really the grid. Um, another way to formulate this is for dense sets, the maximal visible perimeter is between n to the two thirds and n to the three quarters, and both bounds can be attained by dense sets. And is a funny consequence of this. So, I mean, the first consequence is that this Fn, well, the upper bound is now n to the two thirds. The grid gives you this upper bound. Uh, the lower bound we couldn't touch, unfortunately. I strongly believe that it's n to the two thirds, that actually this Fn equals to n to the two thirds. And for, for the following reason, I mean, it seems that a dense set is really bad in terms of visible perimeter. You never can get a linear, a visible perimeter out of a dense set. Uh, it seems that dense sets are bad. And then, but if there are worse sets, worse than n to the two third, then it's not dense. It's something uh, other than dense. So, I mean, at least for me, it's an uh, argument that maybe n to the two third is the truth. Uh, okay, so I plan to give you proof or at least a sketch of one proof and that's for CRM1 that gives you um, the first non-linear or less than sub-linear sub bound. Uh, if you have any dense set, no matter how you choose the stacking order, you will never get uh, more than n to the three quarters as the, well, total visible perimeter or the external, really what I'm interested in is the uh, some of the external angles as you increase the convex hole by adding the points one by one. And the main idea of the proof is to look at the perimeter of the convex hole. So you start with one point, it has perimeter zero. You add points, the convex hole gets bigger and bigger and the perimeter increases. But uh, it doesn't increase too much. So the point is that uh, it starts with, uh, so, well, I said it was dense, so we can scale it so that the minimum distance is 1, the maximum distance is around square root of n. So at the very end, where you take the convex hole of all the points, then it still has diameter around square root of n. So the perimeter is also order of square root of n. So it starts with null, it's 0, and then it gets to square root of n. And the and there is a relation between how the, so this S sub i is the perimeter of the convex hole of the first i points. And it turns out that how much it grows really depends on this external angle. So this is a little bit of uh, elementary geometry to do here. The point is that this is your new point here. And you know that uh, in a radius of one around it, there is nothing in the old uh, convex hole because the minimum distance was one. And that's enough to prove that the uh, new uh, convex hole is uh, uh, 
well, it, it can only increase, of course, it will never decrease, but actually it does increase by something depending on the external angle, actually proportional to the square of the external angle. And that's enough to give this three-quarter bound. So that's basically the proof. Um, this can be achieved by a very simple construction. You just take uh, this uh, grid, basically. I mean, it's a regular square root of n gons, square root of n of them in this fashion, and then you order them inside out. So you go around these circles inside out. And it's, it's just a computation. I mean, give, simple computation gives you that this actually gives n to the three quarters. So you can do that. For the other two theorems, of course, I uh, will be much, uh, give you much less details. But there is some similarities here. So for theorem one, the proof idea was the perimeter of the convex hole. And it's nice to know that the perimeter is actually the integral of the length. So you have some convex object. And the perimeter can be computed by projecting this to a line, measuring the length of the projection, and integrating that uh, around all possible directions. That's a very nice uh, uh, observation. And the next observation is that if you start with the grid, then not all directions are created equal. There are some important directions that are close to some short um, grid vector. And oh, OK. And uh, those short grid, uh, I mean, if you, instead of just integrating, I mean, you concentrate, put more weight on that, then you get a better bound and to the 2 thirds. And there is a connection between um, the, um, the second and the fourth. I mean, the second theorem is a, says that there is this construction where we, it's a concentric grid-like construction. From inside out, you do a clockwise like thing, and that's a good construction. And well, theorem says that for any, any uh, dense set, you cannot do, uh, I mean, you can do something very nice. And it's a random, I mean, you just put this random grid on your set and pretend that it's a grid. I mean, you just put the grid on the set and pretend that the whole set is grid-like. And of course, uh, notice that the exponents are different. So you lose something, but you don't lose that much. Uh, and finally, a related question that might also be interesting, but was already sold by uh, these people. If you are not concentrating on the sum, but you want to have from each disk, you want to see at least some amount of visible parameters to get. And there is a very simple greedy algorithm. So the greedy algorithm that you can come up with is works. And that gives you optimal, optimal uh, results. And the answer uh, is this 2 pi over n for n disks. And well, this is still open where uh, the optimal thing is if your point set is not dense. So as I mentioned, I strongly believe that it's n to the 2 third, certainly not square root of n, but I can't prove anything. Thank you. OK, thank you. Are there any questions? Is there anything known about how hard it is to compute the optimal uh, stacking mode? So as I said, for this related question, it's a very simple greedy algorithm. It gives you the optimal. And for the original question that I was speaking about, I don't know. I don't know. I, I uh, had some conjectures of what algorithm would be optimal, and it wasn't. So I just, I just don't know. Yeah. So the second question. <laughs> uh, suppose you have a, a collection which is, which is dense, and I we formulate the problem, which means I allow to move the original points in order to get, get better results. And then I measure how much I have to move the points, just the length of the vectors. Is this a uh, problem or is it complicated? Yeah, I mean, it, all I can say, it's, well, it's a nice, nice problem. I mean, <laughs> going back to the, I mean, map visualization thing, it might be relevant. I mean, if you cannot visualize it exactly where they should be, maybe you should move it. We didn't, we didn't consider that. 
Okay. No more questions? Thank you again. And the final talk of the conference. The honor is for Eric Fussi. <coughs> so uh, this is a joint work with uh, my colleague Luca Castelli uh, from Ecole Polytechnique and Olivier de Villers from uh, INRIA uh, Sofia Antipolis in, in France. And uh, it will be about the very well studied topic of uh, planar straight line uh, drawings. So I first uh, very briefly recall that we are given so in the plane, we are given a, a plane graph and want to have a representation, planar representation with edges as uh, segments. And <clears throat> so there are some classical algorithms, like the first one, of course, uh, everybody knows is from uh, TUT with a spring embedding principle. And more recently, there have been two uh, classical algorithms that gives uh, polynomial grid size uh, the first one is incremental by uh, De Fresse, Par, and Pollack. Uh, so I will uh, cite it a lot, so I short, uh, shortly call it the FPP algorithm. And uh, the, the second one is by Schneider based on uh, face counting uh, principles. So, but uh, in this talk, I will um, not draw graphs uh, in the plane, so not plane graphs, but graphs on two surfaces, the cylinder and the torus, and in each case I will give periodic straight line drawings algorithm, planar periodic straight line drawings. So I, I start with the cylinder. So a cylinder is uh, topologically just a sphere where you take, uh, take out uh, two uh, disks. Uh, so it can be either um, represented as a, uh, sorry, Hmm? Ah, the pen. Okay. So yeah, it's, it can be it's equivalent topologically to an annulus if you project it uh, flat into the plane. But you can also obtain the cylinder by taking a square and identifying the two vertical sides. Okay. So here is a triangulation of the cylinder. Here it's the annular representation, and here it's a periodic representation. Okay. So why periodic? Because if you take this square and make copies and uh, place them from left to right, you get a drawing that is periodic in X. Okay? So, uh, so now for the torus, so it's uh, similar, but now you identify vertical size and also horizontal side. Okay? So and now, again, if you have uh, graphs on the torus, uh, and it, so you, we call it the flat torus here, uh, again, if you make copies, you, you will obtain a periodic drawing of your graph, but this time periodic both in X and in Y. Okay? Uh, and again, we are interested in finding uh, efficiently a straight line uh, periodic representation of graphs on the torus. <coughs> so, uh, about uh, what is known, so um, the first algorithm to do that has been given by uh, people from uh, Winnipeg, and I think it's uh, incremental with case analysis. So then uh, the second one is uh, adapts the third uh, algorithm uh, to the torus, and also uh, this was also handled in a paper by uh, Duncan Goodrich uh, Koburov. And uh, very recently, uh, Gonsalves and Levesg extended the Schneider algorithm to the torus. Okay? So they obtain a grid size uh, which is quartic. So now about uh, the overview and the main result. Uh, so in the first part, I will um, recall the FPP algorithm for plane triangulations uh, and also give a slight reformulation that is very uh, convenient for us. Uh, with this reformulation, we will be able to extend the algorithm to the case of cylindric uh, triangulations to obtain uh, X periodic uh, drawings, and uh, by a simple reduction from the torus to the cylinder, we will also be able to get uh, periodic drawings for triangulations on the torus. So about the grid size, uh, it's not completely linear, so the width is linear, but the height is linear times 
uh, the graph distance between the two boundaries. So this is for the cylinder. And for the torus, the height is uh, bounded by n times the length of the shortest uh, non-contractible cycle. Uh, non-contractible means you cannot shrink it to a point. Okay? So these are the main results. Uh, but so I've, at first, I will, if, even if many people know it very well, I will recall the, the FPP algorithm and also give us a reformulation of uh, one step. So the first ingredient is the notion of canonical ordering for plane triangulations. So it's a, a shelling order, so you have the bottom edge, and at each step you, you, you take a vertex in the top boundary, but not uh, an extremity of the bottom edge, and uh, you, you take it out of, uh, you, you conquer it in some way. Uh, so you, you do it at each step, so you choose a, a vertex in the top boundary and take it out. So you have to be careful that this vertex is not incident to a chord, otherwise the boundary would not remain a simple cycle. Uh, and then you label the vertices from, uh, here there are seven vertices uh, not, not uh, on incident to the, inc to the bottom edge. So you label them from seven to one uh, until there just remains the bottom edge. Okay? So it's a very well-known notion. And uh, something important for the FPP algorithm is the notion of primal uh, tree associated. So for each vertex which is uh, uh, inside the outer triangle, you, uh, you have a red edge directed toward its neighbor of largest label. Okay? So it's easy to check that it gives a, a tree. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the, the, this neighbor is also the vertex uh, which ch shelling made uh, this vertex appear on the upper boundary. Uh, so this is for the classical formulation of the FPP algorithm. So for the reformulation the, that we will use, the, the, something important is the notion of dual spanning tree. So uh, we add these two outer edges to the primal tree. And it's, uh, now we use the classical duality for plane trees, where so you put a vertex in each face, and uh, when two adjacent faces uh, share an edge that is not in the primal tree, you put uh, an, a blue edge in, which is in the dual tree. So uh, it's uh, well known that it gives a spanning tree uh, of the dual graph. Okay. So before I describe the FPP algorithm, uh, something important is that if you take the vertices in, uh, in increasing order, it gives a way to construct your triangulation step by step, starting from the bottom edge and adding vertices one by one. Okay? So for instance, uh, we call GK uh, the graphs uh, formed by E and the first K vertices. And uh, so G, uh, K, uh, G, so here G5 is obtained by add, adding a new vertex here, uh, that uh, a sort of hat, and uh, you can see that the, the, it covers uh, a path in the, in the graph uh, G4. Okay, so it's always the addition of the new vertex, uh, K plus 1, uh, so K, say, uh, covers a path in the upper boundary of G, K minus 1. Okay, so now we have the tools to, so to define uh, how to, to say how uh, the FPP algorithm works. So say uh, at each step you have a planar drawing of, uh, so here GK minus one, so here it's a generic step with uh, bottom edge horizontal and the uh, top, uh, the edges of the upper boundary are half slope plus or minus one. So and you want to insert the vertex K to the drawing and keep a planar drawing. So what you want to do is essentially to insert this hat as a sort of straight hat with this edge of slope one and this uh, edge of slope minus one. So the problem if you do that, you see that the, this green edge uh, will overlap with this, uh, this edge. So what you do is a first uh, a shift the step to uh, make the slope of the green edge uh, smaller than one and the slope of the blue edge uh, larger than minus one. 
So and by do you just shift the vertices here on the left uh, by one and the vertices here on the right by, by one uh, to the right. Okay, so and then you can insert k as a straight hat and you will not have overlap problems with this edge. For uh, so what I didn't say is what you do with the vertices inside. So actually you might also ship them according to the, the descendancy. Uh, so you look uh, at the ancestor uh, on the upper boundary and it's if shifted, then you shift the vertex inside, okay? So, and by a simple inductive argument, you can check that it remains planar at each step. So here is an execution on an example. The width increases by two at each step and uh, you get a planar drawing with linear uh, width and height. Okay, so now about this slight reformulation that will give, uh, be very convenient. So it uses the, the dual tree. So the step which we reformulate is the shift step, which we use to make the slope of uh, this uh, uh, green and blue edges smaller than one in absolute value. Uh, so instead of formulating as a shift, we use a more local formulation with the dual tree. So as you can see, um, there is a path in the dual tree starting from the edge dual to this uh, green edge. So what we do is just we insert a strip of width one along this path. It exactly uh, is the same as shifting by one the, the vertices on the left and then this, the descendant uh, for the primal tree. Okay, because, uh, because uh, the, 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 this path in the dual tree exactly separates the, the red uh, subtrees on the left from the left red subtrees uh, uh, on the right. Okay, so it's just a reformulation. So we, we do the same to uh, make the slope of the blue edge the light blue edge uh, uh, larger than minus one, uh, and we and and so we insert the next vertex as a hat. So it was just the reformulation of the shift step, but it will be convenient to extend the algorithm to the cylinder. Okay, so now uh, I can talk about the cylinder. So and explain how we can extend this FPP algorithm to this setting. Uh, so. First, first ingredient of the FPP algorithm is the notion of canonical ordering, so this shelling order. Uh, so first to define the canonical ordering, it's convenient to take the annular representation, so it's a triangulation of the cylinder. So the bottom boundary becomes the outer boundary and the top boundary becomes the inner boundary. Uh, so in the plain case, uh, we uh, uh, the base case is when you, at the end, you just have the bottom edge and at each step you take, you share a vertex on the upper boundary. So here, what plays the role of the bottom edge is the outer cycle and what plays the role of the upper boundary is the inner uh, boundary. So which means at each step, we want to share a vertex on the uh, inner boundary. Uh, again, uh, it, uh, to make it work, this vertex should not be incident to a chord, okay? And we do it until it just remains the outer cycle, okay? So there is a technical condition that uh, there is no chord incident to the outer cycle. Otherwise, uh, I mean, the, the area that is outside of the chord, toward the outside, could not be visited, okay? So we, we, it works only under this condition, okay? So now we have a notion of canonical ordering, which gives a way to uh, construct this triangulation step by step and have incremental algorithm. So there is also the notion of primal tree. So now it's a primal forest with the roots on the inner boundary. And there is a notion of dual, uh, this time forest, uh, where uh, actually you, uh, you have to see, we put a vertex in front of each uh, boundary edge, okay? So it's a, now, now it's a forest, but it, it will work the same way. Okay, so now to 
uh, similarly as a planar case, we have to, to say uh, how a generic step will work. So say we have, so now we'll take a representative of the cylinder really has a, as a cylinder, okay, so as a standing cylinder, um, which is like the periodic representation where you physically identify the, the vertical size. Okay, so imagine we have already a, a crossing free straight line drawing of GK minus one with this uh, plus one minus one slope condition for the upper boundary, and we want to uh, insert the vertices of label K. Then we will do the same as the reformulation. We just insert a strip, strip of width one to uh, decrease the slope of this uh, green edge, and the same for the edge on the right. Um, so a shift step would not be convenient because uh, for the shift step you say there is an area to the left, an area to the right, and you shift them to the left and to the right. But here these two areas, they meet behind the cylinder. So this is why it was not convenient to formulate the shift step uh, classically, uh, but with the dual tree, everything is fine. Okay, so and now, as in the planar case, we, we, we insert uh, the, the last vertex as a straight hat. Okay, so uh, just an example. So we first uh, draw the, uh, the base case is uh, just the outer cycle. We place, we draw it just uh, as a line. So it's a periodic representation. We are careful that uh, the vertices uh, must be evenly spaced. So it's just a technical condition so that when you insert a new vertex, it will be on uh, a grid point. Okay, so and now you just uh, an execution so you can check that at each step, there is a, it's a periodic planar, ex-periodic planar representation. And uh, okay, so, <laughs> and is, uh, so it's like the FPP algorithm, but uh, it's periodic in X, so this uh, identifies with this. Okay, so now uh, the grid size, so it can be checked that since uh, the vertical span of each edge is at most the width, that uh, it's at most n times, uh, essentially n times the graph distance between the two boundaries. Uh, and uh, we can uh, easily deal with chords in a second step. Uh, we first decompose along the chords incident to the outer cycles. And uh, if we take care of giving enough initial, initial spacing, then, uh, so we, we draw this, the one without chords, and if we have given initial spacing uh, uh, in, uh, long enough, then we, we are able to plug the, the, this separated component uh, using the FPP algorithm for plane triangulations, and uh, we get a drawing. So it means it works for any triangulation on the cylinder. So finally, I just explained briefly, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, for the torus. Uh, so, an uh, easy way to go from torus to cylinder would be to cut along one cycle. Uh, but the problem is that you duplicate vertices, so it's not very convenient to get a drawing uh, of the torus from a drawing of the cylinder. So, we use the concept of tambourine, which means two uh, cycles directly parallel, two non contractible cycles that are directly parallel. Uh, in this way, when we delete uh, what is inside this tambourine, we don't duplicate vertices. Uh, and uh, well, here is a strategy. So you, with a tambourine, you delete. So you start with something on the, on the torus. When you delete the, what is in this tambourine, which you compute, uh, you get a triangulation on the cylinder. You draw it with our algorithm. And uh, if you give enough vertical space, uh, you can reinsert the edges of the tambourine, uh, so enough space so that these edges have slope uh, greater than one in absolute value, and then it's fine. You don't have any uh, crossing. So, and th this is a drawing of this triangulation on the towers. So, uh, well, I, I, I don't have time for details, but uh, you don't increase much the height, and uh, you can um, you can make sure that uh, essentially you, you see a shortest con non-contractible cycle uh, going from one boundary to the other. And so it means that uh, the height is bounded by n times the shortest non-contractible cycle. Since it's a square root n, the height of our drawing 
is n to the 3 halves. Okay? So we lose the factor of square root 10 compared to the, to the, to the plane. So here are just uh, extensions. So <laughs> I, don't, I probably don't have time. But so just to say that we can extend it to three connected maps and get uh, convex drawings, uh, as in the planar case. And we would like to make our strategy work for a higher genus, but it would require probably to work with periodic drawing in hyperbolic geometry. OK, so that's it. Well, thank you anyway for these nice pictures here. Yeah. Questions, Peter? This gives a straight line drawing on the flat torus, right? Yes, yes. Is it, um, does it is it possible to make that into uh, like a geodesic drawing on the donut-shaped torus? Mm. Yeah, I, I wanted to, but uh, I don't know if there is a way to. So this. Well, you can use a mapping from the flat towards to the donut towards, but I'm just wondering whether the straight lines turn into geodesic. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to think about it, but unfortunately, uh, <laughs> went out of my mind. But I, I'm not sure there is a way to. I mean, if you make a transformation, probably it doesn't uh, maintain the geodesic. So you want to be sure that if you deform it into geodesics in the donut, uh, you wouldn't create a crossing. I, uh, I'm not expert on that, so I, I have to think. Comment on that. I think you have to preserve the local order. You don't have to take the, the geodetic as the shortest curve, but you have to be careful that you go left to right. Maybe, maybe that you have to wrap around as the straight line on the uh, cylinder on the. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you again. So some uh, closing word. <coughs> I would like to, to stress that uh, this conference is the result of a very big cooperative effort. And uh, this is uh, why uh, Walter and I have to thank a lot of people. And first of all, I would like to thank again uh, Lev Nachmanson, who sits down, down there. Please stand up. And his team, Tim Dwyer, where is Tim and, and uh, Natalie Henry Ricci, uh, um, Bong Xin Li, uh, I know but Bong Xin, she couldn't be here now, uh, who made a, a great job um, and managed to perfectly uh, organize the events, uh, keeping prices low in a country where uh, usually um, prices are more expensive than in other countries. So thank you again for the uh, perfect uh, management. And uh, uh, we are also in debt uh, with the program committee members. I see a lot of them in this room. And they made a terrific job uh, selecting uh, papers and posters. Um, and we had 300 reviews, and as Walter said in the business meeting, and uh, one third of them were by external reviewers. And uh, uh, you can rest ass uh, assured that uh, uh, this uh, uh, selection uh, was a huge amount of work. Uh, so uh, above all, and last but not least, I would like to thank all people uh, who submitted a paper to uh, Graph Draw in 2012, a paper or a poster. Uh, we all know how many hours of hard work uh, and uh, of our best time uh, it cost to produce a good paper. Uh, and we had 100, uh, more than 100 submissions among papers and posters. And um, this gives the, the concrete perception that uh, this event is the result of a cooperative uh, effort. Uh, so this is a, a conference that rests on the shoulders of a research community, uh, which is rich of ideas, uh, curious of new things, and open to new people. So uh, thank you for attending. And uh, we now are passing the token to the uh, PG chairs and organizers of next year. Uh, GD, uh, Sasha, Steve, uh, uh, and David Hubert, 
uh, in Bordeaux. And uh, we are sure that they will do a um, wonderful job next year. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next year uh, in Bordeaux. So thank you again.